I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 19th, 2010, I'm interviewing Dr. Ronald Swerdloff for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at the San Diego Convention Center. Dr. Swerdloff, would you please tell me a little bit about your family background, starting with your grandparents? Sure. Uh, well, my grandparents uh, on both sides uh, came from uh, what was Russia at the time, uh, and um, my parental grandfather uh, came here in about uh, the turn of the century, in about 1905. Uh, actually, it's quite an interesting story. He was conscripted into the Russian army uh, and um, was given a clarinet uh, instead of a gun. And he took, the, he was put on the Trans-Siberian Railroad and he got about halfway, kept staring at this clarinet, uh, got off the train, caught the train in the other direction and came directly to the United States. Uh, my, on my maternal side, um, my mother was actually born in Russia and came here as a young girl about age 13 uh, with her mother. Uh, my parents um, uh, lived in, um, in Southern California. I'm a native Southern Californian. Um, and uh, my parents owned a uh, small business. Uh, it started off as a wine shop uh, and then uh, when it was possible actually to sell uh, alcoholic beverages of a harder type, uh, it became a liquor store. Uh, and so I grew up in this small town of Pomona, California uh, in this type of an environment. What was it like growing up in Pomona during World War II? Well, it was, it was quite interesting. Of course, during World War II, uh, most of the men were uh, off at war. Uh, as it turns out, my father had a, uh, a heart condition and wasn't eligible to, uh, to actually participate. Um, and it was, uh, it was a small town. It was a quiet place. Uh, and uh, after the Second World War, when I entered into uh, high school in the early 1950s, uh, then uh, the school was relatively small. Uh, and, but it was, uh, it was a very, very nice environment. The town of Pomona was mainly an orange uh, agricultural area. Uh, at that time, you could see the mountains on an, every day. Um, and most of the people in the town uh, worked in the orange packing uh, plants. Um, the school was, was surprisingly good for a small town. Um, they actually taught Latin in addition to Spanish. Uh, they had a full mathematics program and a full science program. Uh, and it was rather astonishing looking back at uh, how well prepared uh, the students might have been for a future uh, career. What were your favorite subjects? Well, uh, in, uh, in high school, I really was in love with two things. Uh, one, English, because I had this wonderful English teacher that served uh, as a wonderful guide for uh, future learning, uh, and in the mathematic and sciences department. Uh, so I had a fantastic chemistry uh, teacher, and, uh, and we, learned, we, we learned a lot. When did you become interested in medicine? Well, um, I think I was programmed to be a physician. Uh, my parents, uh, coming from this immigrant background, um, thought that, that to be a physician was the most lofty thing that, you could, that they, they could imagine. And of course, the image of the physician at that time uh, was number one in terms of the pe person or the profession that people respected. And so I think I was always told that it would be a good thing that if I could be uh, a doctor, uh, and um, I guess I met my parents' expectations. Why did you choose to attend the University of California at Los Angeles? Oh, that was simple. Uh, we didn't have an awful lot of money, uh, and I'd never been any farther than Los Angeles at that time. Uh, so I applied only to one school. Maybe I applied to two. I probably applied to UC Berkeley, and then I applied to UCLA. I got accepted at UCLA, and so I made the longest drive of my life 
uh, from Pomona to Los Angeles, which was probably about 40 miles, uh, and uh, I entered uh, UCLA. Now, what was your major? I was a zoology major. Um, uh, I actually only attended uh, UCLA for three years before moving on to medical school, um, but my favorite subjects at UCLA were, uh, were history uh, and uh, the sciences, the biologic sciences. And so I really focused uh, uh, on the latter area in terms of my, what would be uh, my major. And how did you come to choose the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine after three years? Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, it, um, I had done, I think, quite well in, in, at UCLA. I had a pretty good grade point average. Uh, and um, after in my third year, my advisors suggested that I could apply at that time for medical school. So I said, fine, where should I apply? And um, so uh, they gave me a long list, and I thought, well, the cost of going to medical school was such that if I went to uh, one of the state schools, which were highly rated, um, that would be terrific. So I applied to UC San Francisco and to UCLA, uh, and I think my first response came from UC San Francisco, and I said, that's it. <laughs> What stands out about this period in your medical training? Uh, do you mean uh, the medical school period? Yes. Oh. Well, medical school was fantastic. Uh, many students find the basic sciences are dull and only a delay to getting to what they really wanted to do, and that was to be able to see patients and care for patients. Uh, but I found the sciences uh, incredibly exciting. Uh, and so I think for the first time in my life, I really dug in uh, and studied, uh, and every day was just a joy. Uh, so, uh, so the basic sciences were terrific for me. Uh, and then when I went on to the clinical uh, sciences, I recognized immediately uh, that the background that I had gained in the basic sciences was going to carry me uh, through. And so the intuitive aspects of clinical medicine and the ability to examine and, and make decisions on patients, uh, I felt was so science-based uh, that if you had the judgment and the intuition to know what compartment to look in, uh, then uh, you would be a success at it. How did you envision your career as a physician at that point when you were leaving medical school? Well, I don't think that I was absolutely certain uh, what I wanted to do. When I was in medical school, um, uh, I spent time in several areas. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, endocrinology kind of was a thread uh, in everything that I was doing, but I didn't realize it at the time. And I had worked with a, a professor of surgery, somebody by the name of William Silen, who went on to Harvard as a professor uh, there. Uh, and he uh, was sort of my hero in, in, in medical school. Uh, and I was destined, I think, at that time for a short time to be a surgeon. And then just at the last minute, I thought, well, the cognitive sciences, um, medicine, internal medicine was more of what I felt was right for me. Uh, and at that time, I thought I'd like to emulate some of these people that were my teachers and the professors, and, and I think at that time I was sort of leaning towards a career as an academician. How did you come to do your internship and residency at King County Hospital and at the University of Washington? Well, when I graduated from, um, from UC San Francisco, uh, I actually had done quite well and was highly ranked in my, in my class. Uh, and I, I think the people at UC San Francisco uh, were hoping that I would be able to stay on in their program there, which was an outstanding program. But I felt like I needed to, to see more of the world. Remember, I had only been to Los Angeles and San Francisco at that time. So I applied widely to what I thought was the most outstanding uh, training centers. 
And ultimately, I chose the University of Washington um, and did my first year at the King County Hospital, which, uh, which was a program that had just reached uh, sort of a pinnacle of, of desirability for many people throughout the country. And so, so um, I headed north. Now, when you left your residency, what, how did you envision your career at that point? Well, uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, this was uh, now in 1964, uh, and I had finished two years of residency at the University of Washington. Um, and I got drafted into the, uh, into the Army, and I was headed for Vietnam. And um, at that time, I think I was pretty accepting of the fact that this is what, was, what I was going to be doing. Uh, and I had a professor of neurology who was my attending at that time on the neurology service where I was rotating. And he said, now he said, I think that you should um, go to the NIH. And I said, that sounds okay. Uh, he said, you could do research there. Uh, I had done research previously in medical school and on a number of projects and had a feeling for it but hadn't done any really serious research to that point. So I went to, caught a plane, went to Washington, D.C., to Bethesda, uh, and stood in line. The line was extremely long. There was a lot of people trying to not go to Vietnam at that time. Uh, and I had an idea of an area that I wanted to work in, and it de dealt with the kidney, and it dealt with endocrine regulation of the, the kidney, and salt metabolism. And I had previously worked and discussed with uh, this about this area with somebody by the name of Isidore Edelman, who was a premier endocrinologist, a brilliant, brilliant guy. So I knew a little bit about the field, and I read about the topic, and I knew that there was two people at the NIH that had been working on this area, and they had polar views. So. Uh, so I arrived there, and being uh, a little overconfident, uh, I told the first person that I thought that his ideas were very interesting and well done, but wasn't correct. Uh, needless to say, I didn't get that job. Uh, and then I went to the second person and told him that I had also read everything that he had done, and I thought he was right on, and he said, well, the job is already filled. <laughs> so I went back to Seattle, and I said, well, I, uh, I think that I've been offered a couple of jobs doing cardiovascular and lipid research, either in Hawaii or Puerto Rico, and all my colleagues thought that was terrific, you know, so I said, okay, maybe I'll do that. But then I went back to my neurology professor, and he said, no, 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 that isn't acceptable. You're going to go back to the NIH, and I have a friend that works in the National Institute of Aging, what was then the gerontology branch, and he works on glucose metabolism and aging, and you're going to go there. So I called this guy up, talked to him for a while. He said, fine, uh, you're on. So that's how I ended up at the, at the NIH. Now, who was the neurologist who uh, recommended you to go to the NIH? What was his name? Uh, he was Charles Lundgren, and he was, uh, was really uh, an exceptional uh, individual, and I was really indebted to him. Unfortunately, he passed away shortly thereafter, and, uh, and his career was cut short. And whose lab did you go to work in at the NIH? Um, well, I went to work in the laboratory of Reuben Andrus, and Reuben was, is still uh, an active uh, investigator, uh, and an absolutely brilliant person. Uh, and, um, and it was just a delight to work with, uh, with Ruben. He was very, very careful, very thoughtful, uh, and, and really brilliant. So I was very fortunate. In fact, as, as we'll talk further, uh, I've been fortunate throughout my career to be associated with really terrific people. What is the glucose clamp technique? Well, the, at that time we were uh, working, uh, Ruben was interested in aging 
and why people, when they get older, have impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, and it was thought at that time that maybe these people have some degree of resistance to insulin. Uh, and he had worked previously uh, on forearm metabolism, looking at substrate flux across the forearm, uh, working by the, uh, with, a, um, with a mentor of his at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, what he was interested in doing uh, was trying to determine if you fix the glucose concentration at a fixed level, um, that, uh, that how much glucose you would have to infuse in order to maintain that level, to attain that level and maintain that level. And by knowing how much at steady state glucose you were infusing, you then uh, could determine how much was being utilized. Uh, and so um, we started this work uh, in a very primitive way. We had a glucose analyzer, uh, and we had uh, some subjects, volunteers, and we had some long plastic tubing, and we had a hand calculator. And so we were doing, he was quite good at modeling, and so we became modelers, and we were there looking at these glucose concentrations and calculating how much more glucose we needed to infuse in an iterative fashion based upon how much we had previously required. And so we could finally get the glucose concentration at a fixed level, and then we could study many other things, the, the insulin secretion and the counter-regulatory hormones and things of that sort. So, um, and this subsequently has become a standard type of, of model for many uh, uh, investigators uh, and had a major impact, I think, on the, the whole field of, uh, of diabetes and glucose uh, metabolism. Would you explain the Baltimore Longitudinal Study and its significance for sure. you? Sure. Well, it's interesting. In, in life, a lot of things recur. These themes, I talked to you about the thread of, of endocrinology in my life. I first had done uh, work on endocrinology as a first year medical student and had the good fortune to win the, uh, uh, the Young Investigator Student uh, Award. Uh, and then when in medical school I had done uh, work on, in the surgery department on, uh, as I told you, on endocrine regulation of the kidney. So, um, so the longitudinal study also has been a thread in my life and has come back on several occasions. And what uh, was being done at the, what's now the National Institute of Aging uh, was this idea that they would take a group of healthy people um, and in a relatively young or middle age and they would follow them throughout their life, measuring various uh, systems uh, in, by blood samples and various type of tests, and they would do that throughout their life. And so this was going to be a very, very long study, not the kind of study that a drug company would do. Um, and, uh, and so we were looking at carbohydrate metabolism uh, with aging, and the reason why this thread comes back is because uh, it also, the data from that, also became the key data that indicated that the male reproductive hormones and testosterone fall with age. And so that came, that now, so now we're going forward uh, another um, uh, 25 or 30 years uh, when this, these data became available and now we're studying um, this whole process of, of uh, androgen deficiency in older men. So that's what the longitudinal study was all about. Did you want to say more about working with Ruben Enders, or can we move on from that now? Uh, well, I would only uh, say one thing, is that, that Ruben was extremely careful. Uh, and he was so careful that, 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 uh, that I was, was very tentative. Um, and uh, and I, I, I wasn't sure that anything that I was doing was going to be quite good enough for, for Ruben's standards. Um, and uh, as it turns out, it was, wasn't bad. And, 
and later as I talk about my next mentor, I will tell you the flip side of that, uh, where, uh, where I had a chance to work with an absolute optimist. How did you come to be an associate resident in medicine at UCLA in 1966? Well, uh, it, I had finished my two years at the National Institute of Health, and I was then met my requirements, and there was a long line of other people wanting to get in. And I had not finished my residency. Remember, I had only gone for two of the three years. And so I wanted to go back to the University of Washington because I had uh, been in contact with people there in the diabetes and endocrine divisions, and they seemed interested in having me back and maybe having a career uh, uh, there. So I called up uh, Bob Petersdorf, who was the uh, chairman of medicine at the University of Washington, and I said, Bob, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ready to come back. And he said, well, so are a lot of other people, <laughs> and uh, why don't you send me an application? And so I thought, well, gee, Bob, uh, thought you'd take me right away. <laughs> so I called up um, a person that I knew at, at UCLA, the professor of medicine, and said, did you have an opening? And he said, please come. And so uh, I ended up at UCLA for my third year of, uh, of, of medicine. Why did you choose to do an NIH fellowship at UCLA in 1967? Well, that was serendipity. Uh, I really was pretty programmed after finishing my clinical training uh, that I would continue in studying diabetes and carbohydrate metabolism and hope to go back to the National Institute of Health uh, where they were developing the diabetes branch, which um, which subsequently, I think, became an institute. Uh, and, um, and that sounded like it would be very exciting. Uh, but I had met, when I was on the East Coast, a person by the name of Bill O'Dell. And Bill O'Dell was uh, head of endocrinology at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center, uh, and already an extremely uh, well-known uh, endocrinologist. And I stopped in to talk to him one day. Uh, and again, like my neurology uh, uh, professor, he said, no, 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 no. He said, you're going to be a reproductive endocrinologist. And the reason is, is that reproductive endocrinology is now. That the tools are available, we can study lots of things, and you come here and work with me, and, um, and it'll be a great experience for you. So uh, Bill O'Dell, for those people who know him, can talk anybody into anything. Uh, and it didn't take very much to convince me that he was, he was right. Uh, so we worked on a proposal. I applied for uh, a individual T32 uh, type of uh, a special fellowship for the, for the NIH, and uh, our proposal was accepted. Uh, and uh, I began another two years of training in a different area of endocrinology. What was the state of the art in endocrinology in terms of the technology and the methodology right at that point when you started? Well, that was sort of what I think was the golden age of, of endocrinology. Of course, there's always many golden ages, but, but uh, it was very special. Because prior to that, the, uh, the methodology in endocrinology was quite awkward and, and difficult. It was exacting, but it was difficult and poorly equipped to measure dynamic changes uh, in a physiologic and pathophysiologic sense. And so the, the, the tools uh, had just been developed uh, for measuring hormones in blood in very, very small amounts. And this work uh, by uh, Beerson and Yallo uh, sort of set the tone, uh, and very quickly people were using this methodology uh, to develop the tools to measure all kinds of hormones. What that meant was is that we could rewrite the textbooks on endocrinology, and uh, in reproductive endocrinology, Bill O'Dell had developed the, the immunoassays for the pituitary gonadotropic hormones, LH and FSH, 
And during the next few years, uh, the assays were being developed, and many of them were developed uh, at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center uh, for the measurement of steroid hormones. So now we could measure both the pituitary hormones uh, and the gonadal hormones uh, on very small amounts of blood. And so almost every day was a new experiment and almost every week was, was a manuscript in preparation. And so it was really it was re a terrific opportunity for somebody in endocrinology. And, and within a, a very, very short period of time, endocrinology became the subspecialty, the discipline that everybody wanted to, to be in. It was, it was quite great. Who are some of your colleagues in the division of endocrinology? Well, um, it, was, it was really uh, an interesting place. Uh, again, things just sort of happen in one's life. And so the, um, uh, there was the head of medicine at this, uh, what was a county hospital, if you can imagine, uh, was a fellow by the name of, uh, of, of David Solomon. And David Solomon is a very prominent endocrinologist. Uh, and he had great support from the dean of the UCLA School of Medicine. And he said that this hospital is going to become the best hospital in the sort of in the country. And so uh, David Solomon had a gift, and he had a gift of being able to recruit the best young people in the country. And one of his first people that he, persons that he recruited was Bill O'Dell. And Bill O'Dell brought a fellow by the name of Stan Kornman with him, who had been working on uh, the concepts of hormone regulation of cancer and had been working on estrogen receptors in the breast tissue. Uh, and so these two fellows joined David Solomon, who was a thyroidologist working on Graves' disease uh, and Graves' ophthalmopathy. Uh, and then in a very, very short period of time, um, Bill uh, O'Dell recruited Delbert Fisher, who uh, subsequently became the president of the Endocrine Society, and I understand is going to give his own oral history today, uh, and I hope I have, have things right. Uh, but, uh, but uh, and Dell, of course, uh, was able to recruit a number of people himself uh, in pediatric endocrinology. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, George Bray, who joined the, joined the group, and George Bray is probably uh, the, if not, or one of the most renowned people studying obesity uh, and, uh, and obesity models. And so we had this group of people that were soon joined by additional fellows that had come into the program. And Bill somehow or another managed at one time to have about 25 fellows from all over the world because he had all this methodology. And so there was the, the group was a, a, there was a fellow by the name of Inder Chopra, who's a very prominent thyroidologist and developed the thyroid hormone assays with Del Fisher and, uh, and myself. And so we had quite, a, quite a, a, a very, very nice group. And these were outstanding scientists, wonderful clinicians, and I couldn't have been any more lucky. What was the the feeling that you had, or the, what was the ethos of the, of the community there? Oh, it was very, very special. Because the Institute, in a very, very short time, you have to realize this was now a public hospital taking care of poor people. Um, and, um, and we had this wonderful faculty. I mentioned the people in endocrinology, but David Solomon attracted people in all disciplines of medicine. And suddenly we became the hottest place in the country for trainees. And so the list of the, the number of people that we had to put on our list to select residents in medicine were very, very, was, was very, very short. Uh, and uh, the place was on the map. Uh, and it was due to these special people that were, uh, were there. Uh, clinical medicine was outstanding and the research was, was terrific. And so we, we, we had it all. During the late 1960s and the early 1970s, what questions were you asking regarding hormonal changes in puberty and sexual maturation? Well, you see, we had the tools then to measure things. 
Uh, and prior to that, we would have to collect large amounts of urine, uh, and, and that was difficult, uh, and particularly in children, to be able to, uh, to do these kind of studies. So we were asking, what are the hormonal events that occur throughout the life of a, of a child that leads to the process of sexual maturation? So we were able to utilize the phenotypic staging that people had already described with the blood hormone measurements uh, from the pituitary uh, and, the, uh, and the gonads and correlate those with the physical uh, findings. Then we begin to ask the questions of how this regulation actually takes place. Is it stimulated first by the brain and the pituitary gland, or to somehow or another the gonads themselves get turned on and then regulate the, the pituitary? So we were studying those type of mechanisms, and we were using animal models, and we were using uh, human, uh, human studies. So, uh, so we learned a lot in a fairly short period of time. And, um, and of course, this work has been subsequently supplemented by uh, a lot of additional science uh, studying the actual regulation that occurs in the, um, in the brain, the hypothalamus, and signals that go to the pituitary gland that regulate this whole process. But there's still many questions unanswered. We still don't know why the system is turned off in the middle of, of childhood. It's active very early in life, something called mini puberty, and then it just gets turned on at the time of, of puberty, and then it's quiescent in between. The whole system is damped down. So we, there's lots more work that can be done. What efforts were you making in the development of methodology and the measurement of hormones? and in characterizing physiological, physiologic endocrine reproductive regulation? Well, you know, as I said, the, the tools were everything. Uh, and so if you, if you can develop the tools, uh, then you can, uh, you can do the studies. And so we had already had, as a result of Bill O'Dell, the gonadotropic hormones, uh, but we needed to have very, very sensitive assays to measure the gonadal steroids, which circulated in much uh, lower concentrations. And these were small molecules, and so the assays proved to be difficult to have adequate sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and then a fellow by the name of Guy Abraham came to our unit. He had previously worked at the Worcester uh, and brought some of the techn technology ideas for measuring these small hormones, and we were able then to develop these assays for many of the sex steroids uh, and use them for physiology of the female reproductive system, of the male reproductive system, and do many, many type of interventional studies. Were you conducting any clinical or preclinical trials at that time? Uh, well, we were. We were doing a lot of preclinical uh, work, building the foundation, but we would then turn uh, to human studies. We had developed a general clinical research center at, uh, at our institution, so we were able to bring people into the hospital, study things. We could study the diurnal variation of hormones, look at a pulse type of, of, of changes. So there was a lot going on that was what we now call translational. Um, research, but at that time was called clinical research. What led to your early research efforts regarding spermatogenesis and male contraceptives? Well, we had done most of the foundation type of work where we understood uh, the, re the feedback regulation of the hypothalamus and pituitary by the gonads. So there's a feedback loop uh, in which when the gonadal steroids increase, it turns off the, uh, the LH and FSH levels from the pituitary gland, uh, and when the concentration fall, they get turned on. So we then had done a number of very basic studies looking at steroid hormone suppression, mechanisms of that suppression, and so it occurred to us that it would be quite possible that we could turn off the system. If we could turn off the signals from the pituitary, we could turn off spermatogenesis in the testis uh, and 
uh, it turned out to be true. What was the role of the NIH and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in these areas? Well, very key, because the, uh, the NIH had developed uh, a, contraceptive, uh, uh, a uh, contraceptive branch, um, and that contraceptive branch had an interest in male contraceptive uh, development. Uh, and so there was a uh, recently passed uh, uh, scientist by the name of Gabriel Bialy, who was the director of this uh, branch, uh, and a colleague of his, uh, Dolores Patinelli, and they had the idea that they should invest some money in looking at this type of hormonal contraceptive approach. And so the investment at that time sort of started the whole process going, which was subsequently continued by the contraceptive, what was then the contraceptive branch, and then a number of other organizations. When did the World Health Organization and the United Nations Family Planning Association become interested in population planning and specifically in, in the work you were doing? Yeah. So, th so this was key also because uh, uh, now we have the NIH uh, with an interest and willingness to put in money. Uh, and then there was another uh, non-governmental organization which was actually getting support from a number of sources, including uh, the Agency for International Development. Uh, and, uh, and then we had the World Health Organization and the UN Family Planning Association. And at that time, there really was an interest. There was a recognition that there, that there was a number of countries throughout the world that had ballooning populations uh, and didn't know how to, to control those in a satisfactory fashion. So the World Health Organization became interested in that and developed some scientific groups, which, which I'll talk about uh, subsequently. And the UN Family Planning Association was interested in, de in investing money in developing scientific centers and practical applied centers uh, in countries like China and India and Indonesia. And so, uh, so these two things were occurring uh, in parallel. Uh, the WHO, once it developed a task force, uh, had enough money from contributors, countries, uh, that were interested in, in population uh, issues uh, that, uh, that they also could support uh, various types of, uh, of research projects. So everything was falling into place mm -hmm. right, right then. Now, how did this early work evolve into studies on infertility? Well, it, it, the, the issue is that if you, um, there's two things that we wanted to do. One is we wanted to control unwanted pregnancies. So we wanted to give people a chance to decide themselves when they were going to have their families, how many, how often, when. Uh, and we also recognize that if we understood how spermatogenesis is regulated in the male, uh, we would be able also to be, have insights into why uh, male factor infertility occurred. So the two are linked and are still linked because, because what can, if you know how to turn off a system, you may very well know how to turn on a system. And so we, this has always been the yin and the yang uh, of this field. After joining the UCLA School of Medicine faculty in 1969, you became chief of the endocrine unit in 1973 and professor of medicine in 1978. How was the endocrine unit functioning when you became chief? Well, it was, it was functioning superbly well, so it, it made my job uh, uh, easier. <laughs> Uh, I was just a young kid, so uh, somehow people had enough confidence in me to let me uh, uh, give it a try. Uh, and, uh, and fortunately, I had, I had terrific faculty and a lot of support, and, and uh, it worked out well. How did you divide your day? Oh, days are funny things because days and nights blend into each other. Uh, and so it, it's hard to say. Uh, that I spent my days and still spend my days doing multitasking. Uh, 
So I have my clinical hat. We have many clinics. We have four clinics uh, uh, each week. We do inpatient consultations. Uh, I still see patients on my own uh, uh, one day a week because it's what I love, love to do. Uh, and we have both basic and clinical research. So we have multiple research meetings, mentoring of, of, uh, of trainees, uh, and then all the administrative things that, uh, that are required in order to run uh, a division. So it means that I am uh, uh, up uh, a lot of hours uh, and do a lot of things. But every single one of them, well, almost everyone, uh, is, uh, is a delight. And so what I like to say uh, to my trainees is that if you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you like who you see, you're a successful person. How did you begin collaborating with George Bray on obesity and nutrition? Well, uh, George Bray was, um, was a senior member of the faculty uh, in the Division of Endocrinology. Uh, and he had uh, developed uh, a terrific interest in the problems of obesity. He was really a pioneer in this area. And he had animal models that, uh, that he was studying. Uh, such as the fatty rat and the, uh, and the OBOB mouse. And it turns out that these models had reproductive uh, problems in addition to obesity. And this sort of begins another one of these threads of nutrition, obesity, reproductive function. And it probably has an evolutionary uh, uh, basis because if you lived in a time when or animals live in a time when they don't have proper food, that's no time to be reproducing. So undernutrition resulted in, um, in decreased reproductive function. And then it turned out that if you were on the other side of the spectrum and obese, you had reproductive problems. So we were trying to figure out whether the reproductive problems were driving the obesity or whether the obesity is driving the reproductive problem. And it's a dilemma that still is the chicken and egg uh, phenomenon. So, um, so George asked me to get involved in some of his studies dealing with these uh, animal models, and we, uh, we did. And what were your findings? Well, we, we discovered uh, that, uh, that reproductive uh, function did occur that it was hypothalamic to, to the great extent, not surprising in now what we know. And we began to look at uh, how this was, uh, was regulated and what type of hypothalamic dysfunction occurred. And subsequently, we spent a, some time in my laboratory. One of the areas of focus was dealing with hypothalamic regulation of LH and FSH. Uh, secretion, which was the key to uh, gonadal uh, function. What was the clinical, general clinical research center? Well, the general clinical research center is a program supported by the National Institutes of, of Health, and they, these centers uh, exist in multiple major medical centers throughout the country, and they provide a means for the federal government to support clinical research. Uh, and so we had a general clinical research center, which was originally set up by Stanley Kornman. Uh, and incidentally, the, our, we still have a general clinical research center, although this is now being superseded by another umbrella program of the National Institute of Health. But our GCRC is now uh, uh, run, directed uh, by my wife, Dr. Christina Wang. Uh, and so it's been a huge help uh, throughout the years for us to, trans to do translational research, take our basic findings, uh, and then begin to apply it to clinical or translational research. So really a key program. Uh, what questions were you asking regarding obesity and testosterone levels? Well, we, we, there, was a, a lot of, there was a lot of issues that we were interested in. We were interested in the influence of nutrition uh, and obesity 
on, uh, on hormonal regulation. Uh, and George Bray was studying a group of individuals who had a syndrome called Prader-Willi syndrome, which had reproductive dysfunction as well as marked obesity and really hyperphagia, uh, this desire to, to compulsion to, to eat. And so we were studying a large number of those individuals. Uh, we were also, he was also studying a large number of obese individuals, and we noticed that these obese indi indi individuals had low serum testosterone levels, but a number of them seemed to be quite strong. While they were fat and he studied their muscle mass, they had increased muscle mass. And so we began to look at whether there was aberrations of binding proteins. And so what you measured in the blood might not reflect what was biologically active. And then, so studies that I did with Alan Glass, who, uh, who has played a, a significant role here in the Endocrine Society, over the years uh, looked at this and we found that sex hormone binding globulin was influenced by both nutritional things and degree de and, uh, and types of obesity. So, so, um, so this became important. Subsequently, we began to look at nutritional influences uh, in terms of specific uh, dietary type of, uh, of changes to specific amino acids in the diet. Are they critical for neurotransmitter? regulation, and so, uh, and that then segued into the issues of nutrition and cancer. So there's a whole thread of, of this interaction between, between nutritional status, obesity, reproductive hormones, the brain and the hypothalamus, uh, and these have been major aspects of, uh, of our work over the years. Which of your interests either as a basic researcher or a clinician, led, to, led you to the study of androgen deficiency? Well, uh, that was pretty natural. Uh, obviously, androgen deficiency became important in our understanding the feedback regulation uh, of the system. But, but, of course, the main reason why uh, men go to a physician uh, for reproductive type of uh, problems are either they're infertile uh, or they uh, have low libido, sex drive, or sexual dysfunction. And so, um, so it became critical, of course, to understand how much of this was due to circulating testicular, testosterone type of, of, of deficiencies. And so we began to study that first in younger men. And then we began to look at new approaches to treatment of testosterone deficiency. And then this was another sort of opportunity that occurred because prior to that time, uh, there was very little interest in the pharmaceutical industry in, uh, in testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, and uh, sometime in this period, uh, maybe a little bit later, um, there was uh, new formulations of testosterone developed and we played a major role in the description of the positive effects of uh, testosterone treatment in younger and middle-aged and to a certain extent at that time in older men uh, on how it benefited them. So the whole area opened up because the concept that testosterone was important for sexuality had been well established back from the days when Browns acquired um, uh, incorrectly uh, took a bunch of uh, testes from, uh, from animals, ground them up, and ingested them and claimed he was invigorated. Uh, he had to recant uh, the studies because he didn't know how to extract them. But, um, but uh, what we then realized was that testosterone was not only a hormone that was important for sexuality, but it was important for muscle, fat, brain, it influenced the, the blood levels of red blood cells, uh, and it had uh, effects on multiple organs. So we were able to describe those effects, which, was, which I think was, was quite uh, helpful. What was your role in developing and evaluating formulations of androgens? Well, uh, it, that was sort of opportunistic because uh, because um, the pharmaceutical industry suddenly became interested in this, and a small pharmaceutical company uh, came to myself and uh, my wife, Dr. 
Christina Wang, and asked us to develop studies, and we did that. And as I told you, we then uh, realized that new formulations could give good blood levels, and we began to look at what blood levels were appropriate to get these type of biologic effects. Would you speak to the development and uses of GNR GNRH? Yeah. So uh, GNRH uh, is a hypothalamic uh, regulatory peptide. Uh, it won the Nobel Prize uh, for, um, for uh, two um, superb uh, scientists, uh, one of whom I think is going to be interviewed today. Uh, and, uh, and this was an interesting struggle that I was sort of watching these developments. Uh, but this, is, this peptide uh, is the stimulator for LH and FSH secretion, which then regulates the entire reproductive system. So, uh, so then people began to recognize uh, that maybe you could make something that looked like this stimulatory peptide, but fit the receptor and turned the system off. So it was kind of a false transmitter, a false hormone. And so um, this was really uh, important. So we, the National Institutes of Health, dealing with the contraceptive development branch, um, the, the contraceptive development branch was willing to give money to help support this whole program of developing new analogs. And so these GNRH analogs uh, were either agonists or antagonist, uh, and, uh, and the agonist came first. And the strange thing was that something that was designed to stimulate, if it was given in a certain fashion, turned off the system. It was a paradoxical inhibitor. So this became important. It was thought that this could be used for contraceptive purposes, but the drug companies really jumped on this uh, as a form of treatment for prostate cancer. It also was looked at for treatment for endometriosis. It was looked at as a treatment for precocious sexual development. Um, and so there was a number of new uses that were coming from these, these paradoxical inhibitors. Um, and then subsequently, uh, it was a little more difficult, uh, these same brilliant chemists uh, were able to uh, create other molecules that were pure antagonists and turned off the system. It turns out that these antagonists were a little more awkward to use, but, um, but they uh, worked even better, uh, more completely, and they didn't have that early stimulatory phase before they became uh, inhibitors. So we began to study this in a number of different systems and reported on these findings and used them in contraceptive type of, uh, of studies, turning off spermatogenesis, and also looked at them in a number of, uh, of other ways and studied the mechanisms by which they may uh, perform these tasks. So uh, another major discovery that came from other people, but uh, we took advantage of it. What was the purpose of the United Nations Family Planning Association? Well, we talked about that before. The UNFPA was really designed to set up these centers in developing countries. Um, and so I would travel around as a consultant and talk with these people, find, try to make sure that they really wanted to do the right thing. They got a lot of money and we wanted to make sure that they were using the equipment and they had a program and they had protocols which we reviewed. And a fellow by the name of Jeff Waits uh, and I, and also uh, my wife Christina Wang, uh, independently was participating in these things. And so we were trying to make sure that these programs actually took off. As it turns out, uh, they were tr tremendously successful. Uh, and for instance, the Chinese uh, certainly have no longer any need for money from the United States to do various types of things, and science just blossomed. And, and so I think it was a terrific investment. What about the WHO Task Force on Methods for the Regulation of Male Fertility? Uh, well, this was a, this was a group of, of consultants uh, that uh, was hired by Geneva to meet several times a year. 
uh, terrific people, absolutely the best uh, scientists from, from around the world. Some were uh, clinical scientists, some were basic scientists, and we would meet and talk about different ways to develop uh, male contraceptive approaches and developed uh, protocols to actually test whether they, this would work. Um, and uh, the WHO and the Conrad organization paired up uh, to, uh, to uh, fund such studies. What's the Conrad organization? Uh, that, that is the Contraceptive Research and Development uh, Organization. It's a, it's a non-governmental organization supported by, to a great extent by AID. Uh, and um, it at one time was a major uh, uh, contributor to uh, funding for contraceptive research. And what key, you said protocols or clinical trials did the task force initiate? Well, there was two really critical protocols. And these were designed to ask the question, does male contraception really work? You know, well, we were fiddling around doing all kinds of studies, getting money to do basic research and, and applying it in a small fashion. And so we said, okay, time to bite the bullet. So we actually did a study, uh, did it in uh, centers throughout the world, and much to our delight, it worked. And so we found that, the, that hormonally directed, and in the initial studies were using testosterone by itself, and subsequently we combined it with progestins, very much analogous to the female contraceptive, but we found that we could be as successful uh, as the female-directed uh, oral birth control pills. So we were really thrilled by that, but it has not yet come to practical fruition because we have no such products that are approved for use in the market yet. You've mentioned uh, your wife, Dr. Christina Wang, yeah. uh, and I know she's a noted international endocrinologist in her own right. What is her scientific background? Well, well, Christina was uh, trained in Hong Kong uh, in internal medicine and then endocrinology in a very, very accomplished group. Uh, then spent two years at the Howard Flurry Institute, Flurry Institute uh, at Melbourne University in Melbourne, uh, and then came to the United States to work with Sam Yen, uh, a prominent uh, gynecologic endocrinologist here in the United States, and then up to Seattle to with Alvin Paulson, who was kind of the father of all male reproductive uh, uh, research, uh, and then went back to Hong Kong where she was a named professor uh, and head of the endocrinology uh, unit. So she has uh, very good credentials. How did you meet? Uh, that was very interesting. We met in what was then Bombay uh, and uh, at a World Health Organization uh, uh, task force meeting. We had, the two of us had just come on to the, uh, the task force from different parts of the world. Uh, and we met at that time and we were colleagues and, and friends. Uh, and uh, later we became husband and wife. Would you talk about the impact of nutrition on cancer? Yeah, well, it turns out that, that nutrition has an important impact on, on cancer, and we really didn't understand that uh, originally, uh, but uh, it's known that people who are obese, are females that are obese are at greater risk for, uh, for breast cancer. Uh, and it's also known that men who are obese uh, are at greater risk of uh, prostate cancer. And so this is a very important phenomenon. The question is, we understand a little bit better how that occurs in, in females, and it's thought to that the risk is associated with the increased um, conversion of precursors to estrogens in the fat tissue, but in the, um, in the uh, male, male uh, the increased fat in the diet, which is something we've uh, studied, uh, also has a negative impact on prostate cancer. And so we have been doing studies to see if the mechanism of this is related to alterations of 
testosterone metabolism to dihydrotestosterone in the prostate gland itself, uh, and these studies are ongoing. What was the salience of these studies for your interest in spermatogenesis regulation and apoptosis? Well, um, the, these, the, these studies uh, actually aren't exactly linked to, to the issue of apoptosis if you're talking about the nutritional type of, uh, of things. They may be linked, but it isn't an area that we've focused on. Um, it is a, important in, uh, in certain areas of, uh, of androgen metabolism, clearance of androgens, uh, and uh, influences the, the signaling process that, uh, that occurs in, in reproduction. If you're, if you're, you're severely undernourished, then you have failure of the regulatory system and probably have impaired spermatogenesis, but that hasn't been a major uh, link. What led you in the mid-1990s to study the mechanisms that suppress sperm counts through programmed cell death? Yeah, well, we didn't know. We knew that if we turned off the signals from the pituitary that we would cause the sperm counts to disappear, to come to zero. But we didn't know why that happened. Did that happen because we turned off the production of sperm, or did it occur because the, we uh, increased the, uh, the program death of the germ cells. So we needed to study that. So we began by studying the normal regulation, the proliferation process, and discovered that program cell death of germ cells was a very highly structured process. Uh, and, uh, and then we then turned off the system and saw that this resulted in the massive increase in, uh, in program cell death, uh, which then led us to the question, well, how does it do it? And so we began to study the signaling pathways that are associated with, uh, with apoptosis uh, of the germ cells in the, in the testes. And of course, people had been working on this in cancer. So uh, there was a lot of leads, but the testis was different. And so we found that this was a mitochondrial regulated process. It was an intrinsic pathway type of defect. And then we did the tedious job of creating all the building blocks and the signal signaling pathway. And we're still in the process. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we really want to know uh, if we can find a testis specific target. So we, that might be responsible for male infertility that we can turn on, or might be a specific target that we can turn off uh, for male contraception and avoid having to go through the entire system from the hypothalamus and the pituitary so we can do it quicker. Who are your colleagues on that? Oh, we, well, the colleagues for this have been, we've had a number of colleagues, both in the United States and in, uh, and in China. Um, my colleagues in the United States have been uh, Christina Wang, my wife, uh, and, um, and Amiya Sinahikam, uh, and uh, Zha Yu, and, uh, and, um, and um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, 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 Yan He Lu. Sorry. <laughs> So, and Dr. Yanni Liu has been, uh, been really a, a key person in many of these studies. So you see this as having a huge potential for, uh, well, actually, I, what I mean is, what about the potential for male infertility as far as this goes? Well, we're not there yet, but what we would very much like to, see, right now, much of the work in male infertility has been subverted by the fact that, that the people who do in vitro fertilization have found a way to pick up little, uh, pick up a sperm, stick it in an egg, and it works pretty well, but it's very, very expensive. So we do not know the, what uh, all the degrees of dysregulation that, uh, that occur uh, in the key things that we could find that would be reversible, and so we're still, it's a work in progress. What were the sources of your interest in Kleinfelter syndrome? Uh, Kleinfelter syndrome is very 
uh, important to me. Uh, and again, this was serendipity. I began to see patients that had this disorder. Most people thought that these were mentally retarded individuals who couldn't have children. Uh, but when I began to, uh, to look at these individuals, I realized that they had some very, very interesting and broad spectrum of defects. Kleinfelder syndrome is a disorder where people have an extra X chromosome. So they're XXY instead of the usual male XY or the usual female XX. Uh, and they, we discovered, or it was known, that there was defects in learning ability and that this was not a broad defect, but this was a type of dyslexia. They also had executive dysfunction, a frontal lobe and, a, and, and temporal lobe type of defect, and they had increased alterations in immunity. They had a number of other broad clinical uh, problems, and so I became very interested in this, and I began to see more and more patients. My clinical uh, hat was on, uh, and as I saw these people, I realized that there was a very broad spectrum of abnormalities that occurred, and I wanted to know why. We thought that this was due to a dosage effect due to genes on the extra X chromosome that weren't being X inactivated, uh, but we didn't quite know. So we then turned uh, to develop an animal model. So we developed an XXY animal model, which, we, um, which was very helpful in, uh, because it mimicked the clinical disease in many ways. And so we've, we've reported a, a number of findings, the effects of XXY on bone metabolism and whether this is testosterone or another type of gene-associated defect. We've looked at behavior. We've looked at sexuality. We've looked at uh, the effects on the testis and reproduction, studied the time course of this whole thing, and so it's a very exciting area uh, and one that will be very clinically applicable because this condition occurs in one out of every 500 men throughout the world. What has been the extent of your interest in androgen behavior relations and neurocognition? Well, we've been very interested in androgens and uh, in uh, cognition and androgens and uh, and and behavior, um, and it's it's a it's a rather complex uh, area. We've looked at it in terms of animal models and in humans, um, and we've looked at such things as multiple sclerosis to see if androgens and its immune suppressive effect might have a benefit there. And there's some leads that suggest that that may be beneficial. Uh, and right now we're doing studies that are led by Dr. Al Matsumoto at the University of Washington and part of the testosterone trial to look at androgen replacement therapy in, uh, in older uh, men to see if it will have a positive impact on, on cognition. We had previously looked at androgens and mood. We know that testosterone deficient men um, ha are depressed. Uh, they don't have what we would call pathologic depression, but they have depressed mood, and that's a major clinical problem, and when you treat them with testosterone, that improves. Would you sketch out the history of testosterone deficiency with aging in terms of uh, etiology, diagnosis? Yeah, so this, is, uh, this uh, then goes back to that longitudinal study uh, where it was shown that testosterone begins to decline at about age 30 and declines progressively with time. And what the people at the uh, National Institute of Aging then reported was that by the time you got to the eighth and ninth decades of life, that a high percentage of the individual had levels that were below the normal range for young, healthy adults. And so the question was then, how much of this decrease in testosterone uh, is, uh, is uh, critical for healthy aging or lack of healthy aging? Uh, and so uh, we wanted to know if testosterone replacement would be beneficial. We don't know the full answer to that yet, but we're presently doing a study that is headed by uh, Peter Snyder at the University of Pennsylvania. It's a multicenter study, and I have the good fortune of being one of the key investigators. And we're studying the effects of testosterone replacement on cognition, 
on vitality, on sexuality, on frailty, and, and on cardiovascular uh, endpoints uh, to see if we can create a more healthy aging. Realizing that older people, their greatest fear is losing their independence. If we could have a positive impact and delay the loss of independence, that would be a huge benefit to our increasingly older population. And that is the T-trial? That's called the T-trial, yes. And what is the treatment protocol that you have for that? Well, the treatment protocol is a double-blinded, placebo-controlled study, meets good guidelines, uh, and we're looking at individuals above the age of 65 who have, uh, who don't have diseases that would cause them not to be willing, willing or able to participate, uh, and we're treating them either with, uh, with the male hormone testosterone, if they have a demonstrable low testosterone concentration, or we're treating them with placebo, and we're looking at these various endpoints. We also are going to be studying the, uh, the, um, the molecular mechanisms by looking at DNA uh, assessment uh, to try to determine what the correlations of symptoms with, uh, with a d disease are, with low levels, and then to determine if there's some predictive aspects in terms of who's going to benefit and who isn't going to benefit. And ultimately, of course, we're going to have to look at adverse effects. How controversial is testosterone replacement for androgen deficiency associated with aging? Well, I think it's still controversial. We don't know whether it's going to be beneficial or whether there's going to be adverse effects. It'll occur as we treat large numbers of, of people. And that's really going to be a very, very important point because you want to have benefits but not at too great a burden. So, uh, so this is important. It's also conflicted by the fact that there are a lot of enthusiasts uh, and if you read the newspapers, you'll see pictures of people who look like they're fat and middle-aged, and then they get treated, and they're really, you know, 70 years of age, and then they get treated, and they look like these buff, terrific guys. And so we want to, we want to bring science to the whole process, which then gets to the other issue, which uh, is very important, and that is the abuse of androgens. And, and this is another hat I wear because I get involved with, with, the, uh, with the recognition of athlete abuse and, and things of that sort, which is important. Maybe we can talk about that some other time. <laughs> Would you talk a little bit about your philosophy of mentoring? Yeah. So, you know, when it's all done, uh, what's important is the legacy you leave. And so the legacy is usually those individuals who will be brighter and more capable than you and who will take the ball which, or, the, uh, or the baton that you hand to them and let them go forward and really discover good things. And mentoring is not easy. Uh, first, you have to have a receptive uh, uh, people, uh, and you need to encourage them but set high standards for them. And that's not easy either because it's a very, very delicate balance. If you're too tough on them, they give up, and if, they, uh, and if you don't encourage them enough, they, uh, they don't really work hard enough. And so uh, you really have to find the right people. And I've been blessed by having uh, a, a whole long list of really wonderful trainees. Uh, many of them are extremely successful uh, scientists and clinicians, and, uh, and I'm sure that, that many of them have well surpassed uh, their mentor. And that's what it's all about. So the most important thing about mentoring is you create people who are smarter, better, and more energetic than yourself. Would you talk a little bit about the nature of your relationship with the Endocrine Society over the years? Sure. The Endocrine Society, of course, is the intellectual home uh, for most uh, endocrinologists. The Endocrine Society is a place where the uh, where uh, information is conveyed from one person to 
to a large number of individuals on a repeated type of basis. It's also an organization that provides an opportunity for communication at multiple levels. We create guidelines uh, for practice. Uh, we create a uh, teaching environment for, for our clinician colleagues. Um, and so, and it's a place where we can meet on a on a one to one basis. And uh, the, the, my only real problem with these meetings is, is is that there's so many people to talk to, and so many things to listen to, and so many people tugging on you that you don't. You really the meetings need to be a month long <laughs> instead of instead of the four days that they usually are. So the Endocrine Society has been terrific, and I've had an opportunity to. Uh, to serve as uh, as a, as program chairman in various ways, different types. I've served as the editor of uh, an editor of the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and and Metabolism, uh, and uh, and I've just learned a lot from from uh, being having an opportunity to participate with the Endocrine Society. Not the least of which is the chance to talk to you and tell you about the things that I have done would like to do and hope will do in the future. What are your current views of the field? Well, uh, endocrinology has been right at the forefront uh, of, uh, of science. So much of the advances that occur in other fields of biomedical science actually come from the work that the endocrinologists are, are doing. The outlook is, is I think, is terrific. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, than we did when I started. Uh, much of the information we thought was correct, we now know is wrong, uh, but we're learning uh, every day. And so I think that endocrinology has a really very bright future as a, as a science form uh, as well as a clinical uh, direction for, uh, for our physician colleagues. Thank you. You're welcome.